message. Welcome to everyone here and welcome to everyone who is listening either on our Facebook, YouTube, or web page. It would mean so much to all of us here if we knew what you were thinking about this program. Let us know how you would like to see it changed, how you would like to see it uh, stay the same, and some questions that you might have that we would be able to share here together. So let us start, we're starting with Exodus 2, and let's go straight to that text because there's so much in this one chapter. Now, if you'll remember last week when we left Egypt, things were really bad for the Israelites. Things were desperate. It truly was a matter of life and death, but mostly death. Awful. And into this awful world, a child is born. And this book, the book of Exodus, is the story of that child. And we will see this child story become bigger, much bigger, as the story grows from the birth of a baby to the birth of a people. We'll see a nation being born. But for now, the people are dying under the very harsh, cruel rule of the Pharaoh. The people are slave laborers, construction workers, brick builders, and they're building bricks to construct storage facilities, actually storage cities. Every year, Pharaoh collected taxes from all the people in the form of animals and grains and crops of all kinds, not in dollars and cents, not in money. So places were needed to store all that food. So this is why the Hebrews were making bricks for silos and storage sheds, and it's hard work. Now, while we read our Parsha today, watch out for the women because they're going to take over the story for a while. You do, I right? I say that the entire my, my whole life. <laughs> they don't just take over the exodus, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Now, in our last class, we met the midwives. Remember them? Who were they? Shifra and Pua. And they were the lifesavers who feared God. So they were God-fearers, which doesn't really mean they were afraid of God. Rather, it means that they were in awe of God. When you see the word fear, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, don't think scaredy cat fear. Think awe, amazement at this power and grace and love that is showering down on us. So. They, the people that we're going to read about today, are in love with loving and obeying God. That's nice, right? Now next week we're going to meet three more God-fearing women who will change the world. Now Exodus 2, more family stories, more like family legends, Tom, like you always talk about. Maybe even myths in some ways. And we're going to see that J, our author J, and the author E, and the P author, the priestly author, all contributed their talents to this text. So three people actually wrote what we're reading, and then a fourth person, or school of people, came in and redacted it, edited it, put it together into a book. And most scholars agree that the final version of this chapter was written no earlier than the Babylonian exile period, which means it was redacted 700 years after the events in the story are said to take place. It's a big time difference. So now let's look at the text. Exodus 2, ready? A certain man of the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. Now the Levites were one of the 12 tribes of ancient Israel. And this tribe became the priestly class of that society. Now these newlyweds are not named yet, but they
they will be named by chapter six and we'll get to know this certain man actually i think by verse six and we'll get to know this certain man and especially this woman a lot better but now we know that not only are these two both from the tribe of levi they're actually much closer than that this is an avunculate marriage avunculate have you ever heard that word it means pertaining to the uncle of Unko A. Um, or in this case, it refers to the aunt because this man married his father's sister. Got that? Mm -hmm. Is this even legal? Well, at this time, That's yes. His aunt, right? Yeah, his aunt. His yeah. father's sister would be right, his aunt. His aunt. But so, it, so it's an avuncular um, marriage in that she marries her uncle. Happens all the time in West Virginia. Well, I'm gonna get to that. <laughs> um, at this time it was legal, but Torah later on is going to forbid this kind of marriage. And we'll see that when we get to Leviticus chapter 18. But what about today for us? Is it legal? Well, I looked it up and I could learn that it is legal in 48 states today. Only two states, um, no, so sorry, it is illegal in 48 states. Only two states allow it, and can you guess what two states? Kentucky and West Virginia? <laughs> no, it's not West Virginia. Seriously, Utah? Utah. No. no, Rhode Island and New York permitted under certain circumstances. Wow. How weird is that? I would have said um, Utah because of, of Mormons mm -hmm. marrying younger. And multiple. And multiple polygamy. But it's New York and Rhode Island. Very strange. Um, and of course, they, they just haven't gotten around to yeah, changing. They may have laws, but people can do what they want. They don't have to I mean, they, they could be living with their sister and move to another Jeez. state, who knows? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> that's what we have to watch out for our, our children, right? Now, even though Torah doesn't tell you until later in the uh, text, I will tell you right now that the Levite man is named Amram, Amram. And the Levite woman is called Yaakobed. Have you heard of them? Amram and Yaakobed? And these two are living under the very harsh rule of Pharaoh, who is never named in this chapter, which I thought was interesting, right? These two know-nothing Hebrews are named, but Pharaoh, the, the most powerful man on the planet at that time, not named. And I liked um, Walter Brueggemann's explanation. He's a wonderful scholar of uh, Old Testament. And he said, why isn't this brutal Pharaoh ever named? Well, you don't need to know his name because if you've met one Pharaoh, you've met them all. They're all that bad. Well, that is not true for this Levite family. They are all standouts. And now our story begins and describes the birth of a hero. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go, ready? The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw how beautiful he was, she hid him for three months. Now this baby was beautiful and healthy. The text says the baby was tov, tov, which means good. Remember when we say shavua, tov, have a good week, tov is Hebrew, for good. And all babies are good, right? Yes. So of course, yes. the mother hid her baby so that Pharaoh would not learn of his birth and have the child killed. Imagine that. And when we read this verse, we get the idea that the Levite man meets his Levite aunt and they fall in love. And soon after that, a beautiful, healthy, good baby boy is born. Not exactly like this though. We already have two kids. 
a daughter and a son. And they are Miriam and Aaron. So this new baby is their third child. Aaron must have been born before the kill all the male Hebrew babies law was in effect. So why does Torah set up the third baby's birth this way, as if it were the first, right? Well, there is an interesting and I think an endearing midrash about this. If you'll remember, a midrash is an ancient, well, it doesn't have to be ancient, but it's an explanation, a hermeneutical reason. Why are we reading this? Why was it written this way? So here's the midrash. Amram is a leading scholar in the community. Everybody looks to him to interpret the Torah and to explain God's plan for them. When Amram learns about Pharaoh's plan to kill all male babies, he cries out, we are laboring in vain. And of course it was the Hebrew women who were doing all the laboring, right? But we understand Amram's grief when he says, we are producing sons who will be killed and this can't be permitted. So he convinces all the Hebrew men to divorce their wives, so no more sex, so no more babies for Pharaoh to kill, no more killings. And this really upsets six-year-old Miriam. It's their oldest child and she's a very wise child who becomes an even wiser woman I think the world would be different today if Miriam had led the Exodus through um, and had showed up with Jesus on that mountain when they were all transfigured. But alas, we have to deal with what we've got. So now Miriam, the six-year-old, stands up to her father, who is a respected scholar, and she says, shame on you, father. You are worse than Pharaoh. And think about this. That bloodthirsty horrible Pharaoh and his horrible bloodthirsty plan will exterminate the Hebrew male babies. But your plan for our men to divorce their wives, your plan is even worse because your plan will effectively eliminate our entire people. There will be no Hebrew babies, not male, not female. So there'll be no more of us pretty smart for a six-year-old, right? So Amram puts on his scholarly look, you know, picture this rabbi, and he rubs his beard and he says, good point, Miriam. And then he advised all the Hebrews to remarry their wives and continue procreation. And they did. And that's how this baby boy, born to this family, came to be. And see, that's kind of what your Sunday school teacher did with the Bible, read a Bible story and explained how it happened and why it happened. We just never knew there were so many others than Mrs. So-and-so who taught us in the same say, uh, sixth grade or something, right? I have a question. Yes. Where does it say the story you just told? It's a midrash. It says it in the Talmud um, or in Sorry. the Mishnah which is a collection of explanations. If you have a Bible that has writing on the sides that explains, those are midrashes. So it doesn't Hebrew come from a, from a um, cuneiform or what? It's, what sometimes, it's from. sometimes, absolutely yes. It comes from an ancient story that okay. had been told before, but, or it comes from a scholar's explanation or it comes from something that's newly discovered. Oh, look, this, this tablet in cuneiform form about this story. Well, that kind of sounds like Noah's story, or it sounds like so, and, and you're going to see that happening in today's Parsha too. So the baby is, oh yes. What's this six-year-old? That's gotta be wrong. Oh, I mean, not if there's a smart six-year-old in our family, and he wouldn't come up because he's not a girl. This is a girl. This is Miriam coming up. I don't think that 12 year old would come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miriam is advanced for her age. I guess. But now the question is,
how to keep that little baby alive, safe from Pharaoh's murdering decree. And here's what Hokabed, uh, Yochabed does. When she could no longer hide the baby, she got a wicker basket. We know this story. And then she caulked it with bitumen and pitch to make it waterproof, right? And then she put the baby in the basket and then she put the basket and the baby among the reeds by the bank of the Nile River. And that's her plan. And it sounds so dangerous. Imagine doing that with your three-month-old infant. Terrifying, right? Well, in our text, at least the text I had when I studied for this, um, the author uses this Hebrew word for basket, teva, teva. And it's the same Hebrew word that's used in the Noah story for ark, which kind of makes sense, right? The ark is also described as a teva. And as the ark in Genesis saved Noah and his family, we'll see that this ark, this um, teva, saves this family here in Egypt. Now, the author, who many scholars say is J. Um, is sending us a signal. Just as the flood in Genesis signaled a new era in the history of the people and their relationship with God, remember the flood destroyed almost the entire human race. Well, Pharaoh's decree to kill all male babies almost destroys the entire people of Israel. And their hope is in that Teva, right? But back to the story. So. Yochabed has placed the basket in the river and she has placed her daughter, her six-year-old spunky wise Miriam, on the banks of the river, watching the baby in the basket to see what would happen to the baby. Well, it just so happens that Pharaoh's daughter came down with her maid or with her maids to bathe in the river. And she saw the basket there floating among the reeds and she sent her slave girl to fetch it out of the river. What are the odds, right? A baby hidden by his mother for three months. None of the neighbors expect anything. And the desperate plan to place the baby in danger in the river. But then the baby is spotted by Pharaoh's daughter. What are the odds, right? sounds like a fairy tale and some scholars say it sounds like a fairy tale because it is a fairy tale and not an original one either and this is what you brought up there is a much older version of this story that was still known when this version was written and the older tale told about a king named Sargon in the 24th century BCE his mother put him in a basket too and put the basket in the river and baby Sargon was found by a young woman who lived in a palace by the river. And he was brought up in the palace and trained as a scribe and he grew up to be healthy, wealthy, and wise and a very important king. In real life, Sargon of Akkad around 2300 BCE. So the story that we're reading today takes place around 1300 BCE. And so clearly the story has had staying power. People like it and they still do. But it does seem very, very far-fetched. Just think about this. Would a princess, a member of the royal family in Egypt, would she bathe in public? Or would it would she have her slaves schlep the water into the palace and pour it into her beautiful um, private bathtub? And seriously, think about it. You know what lives in the Nile River, right? Crocodiles. Giant crocodiles. Ooh, speaking of a cute little crocodile. Hi, honey. Hi. The Nile is a crocodile-infested river. So, say the sages, if the princess is going into the water, it is not the Nile River. 
Rather, it's probably an offshoot of the river. Also a special spot, which is the Hiswidi, which is not only very private, it's also very safe for princess eating crocodiles. Which is why they say the very wise Yakobed picked that spot in the first place to set the basket holding the baby. And mom was sure to have her daughter, Miriam, keep watch. Now, it doesn't say any of that in the text. That's all midrash. That's all hermeneutics. That's all logical, theological, hopeful explanations of what happened, why it happened, how it could have happened. <coughs> and we keep doing it. So maybe the princess was taking a river bath. Or maybe she was just walking by the river, but she saw the basket and she drew it out of the water and she opened the basket and she saw it was a child, a boy child. And the child was weeping. So she took pity on it. She said, this must be a Hebrew child. And it's interesting because this is the only place in the Bible where a baby is said to be weeping. Usually, when a baby is making noise um, and not happy, the baby is crying. We don't usually say, oh, my baby was weeping because I was late with this bottle or something, right? Um, Mine says cry. Mine says cry. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, that's a shame. Um, and that's the kind of hermeneutics, that's the kind of scholarly stuff that we live for, you know, like listening to those words. Um, but different part of the story, different stress. Um, usually when an infant is crying, we picture this red-faced baby wailing at the top of his lungs, right? And I think we can assume that that's what is happening here for sure. The baby in the basket is making some noise because he's probably hungry. And I bet his mother didn't even feed him before she placed him in that basket mm -hmm. on purpose so that now the whole world hears this baby crying, at least everyone near the river. So Miriam shows up and says to the princess, boy, is that baby crying. He must be hungry. Do you want me to go get you a Hebrew wet nurse, a woman who will suckle the baby? And Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, please. So Miriam went and got, guess who? Jacobed, who was already lactating. And she met the princess who told her, take this baby and nurse it for me, and I will pay you wages. So Jacobed took her son and nursed him. And this is a dream come true. It's almost unbelievable and very, very ironic. J is full of irony. Pharaoh's evil plan is thwarted by his own daughter. And the custom at this time was to nurse a child for at least 24 months, sometimes even longer. So how wonderful is this for his mother, right? She didn't have to hide her beautiful son. She didn't have to fear for his life. And she could nurture him for these very important formative years. And yeah, most importantly, she's getting paid. Then she's getting paid for it. Right? How many mothers can say that? Exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. Wow. Uh, that's right. That but there job? is a downside to this argument. Sure, the wet nurse gets paid for nursing the baby, but when the baby is weaned, she has to give the baby a vacuum. But some traditions say, and traditions, once again, midrash stories, hermeneutics, exegesis, that Yaakobed went with the baby to the palace as a nanny. So what are the odds, right? Now, verse 10 continues the story. When the child grew up, that's to say when the child was weaned, no longer suckling on the mom, Yaakobed brought him to the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, who made the child her son. She adopted him and she named him Moses, explaining, I drew him 
out of the water. And we're going to talk about that name. So now Moses, two, two and three quarters, three years old, and he has spent the first three years of his life with his birth mother and with his birth family. So we can assume that Hebrew would have been his first language. And I wonder what Jacobet, his birth mother, called him. We only know him by the name Moses. So what kind of a name is Moses? Well, as you can imagine, tons of interpretations about this. In Hebrew, the name is Moshe, Moshe. And many say Moses is an Egyptian name, not even Hebrew. But others say, hell no, it's not Egyptian, it's Hebrew. And there seems to be some scholarly evidence for both claims. Well, maybe not evidence, but maybes. Maybe Moses means drawn out. But think this, I found this fascinating. Maybe Moses is the subject of the verb, not the object. She drew Moses out. Maybe it's Moses was drawn out. So it's more like a foreshadowing. Moses draws out. And Moses will, when he's grown up, draw out the people from bondage in Egypt, right? He, he will lead them to the promised land. And I like that explanation. And it shows me the brilliance of Jay's writing. But on with our story. So sometimes after Moses is weaned and named, when he had to grow up, he went out of the palace and he went about to his kinfolk. No um, doubt that he's a Hebrew. He's raised as an Egyptian prince, but he's a Hebrew. He knows he's adopted. And he went to see the Hebrews. He's probably managing a building site somewhere. And he was watching the Hebrews work as slaves, making bricks and building. And he saw how hard they were. And then he witnessed an Egyptian slave master beating a Hebrew slave, one of his adopted kinsmen beating one of his natal kinsmen. And oddly enough, Moses is about 40 years old now, and he knows who he is, a Hebrew. He's not really an Egyptian. And he sees his fellow Hebrew suffering all of them are toiling and slaving for Pharaoh. And he sees the abuse the Egyptians are heaping on the Hebrews. And this is his proverbial, ta-da, moment. His wake-up call. This incident begins a new section of his life. And it shows us what kind of man Moses is. He sees the whipping and the beating. And Moses looks around looks right and he looks left and he sees that no one is watching so he struck down the Egyptian Moses killed him and then Moses buried his body in the sand now the Hebrew slave that was being beaten must have hightailed it out of there really fast and we don't read that Moses was ever thanked for his action but we do know that there were no witnesses to the killing except Moses and the man-slave that he rescued. So when Moses went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting with each other. And we get the idea in some texts that one of these Hebrews is the man that Moses rescued the day before. And if that's true, the words of Moses show his disappointment. And they're especially poignant and touching. Moses says to the two Hebrew guys who are fighting, why are you doing this? Why are you fighting your fellow Hebrew? And one of the Hebrews answers Moses like this, what's it to you? Who made you chief and ruler over us? And this doesn't sound good and it gets worse. He continues to taunt Moses. What are you going to do about it? Will you kill me like you killed that Egyptian overseer yesterday, he busted. Now there's at least one witness to that murder, and you know people can't keep something like that quiet. They talk, and 
Pharaoh heard the talk. And he decides that Moses has to pay for his crime with his life. How harsh is that? Remember, Pharaoh is his adopted grandfather. And now Pharaoh says, Moses must die. So what does Moses do? Moses runs. He runs for his life. He flees from Pharaoh. And he goes to the land of Midian, which is a long, hot trip. So as soon as Moses gets to Midian, no surprise, he stops and he sits at the well in the town. Remember Jay? She likes well stories. If things are going badly, she writes a well story. If things are going well, well, she writes a well story. And here's another one. So how far did Moses run? Well, we're not sure because we're not sure exactly where Midian is, but we're relatively sure that the Midianites were known as sand crossers, Bedouins. They were Bedouins, but we're not sure exactly where Midian was then or where it is today. Some scholars say the Sinai Peninsula. Others say Saudi Arabia. We're just not sure. But most are sure that Moses <coughs> went to Midian, wherever it is, on purpose. Because the Hebrews and the Midianites are kinfolk. They're like distant family members. And Moses thinks they'll be friendly to him. Now remember when Sarah died, Abraham remarried Keturah. And they had six sons. Remember? And one of those six sons was named Midian. So, say some, that's where Midian is, and that's how Moses is related to this family. But others say that Midian isn't really a place or a person. It's a tribe or a group of tribes who have always been friendly with the Hebrews. Well, they're only friendly for a while, and they didn't stay friendly. They became vicious enemies we'll see that as we walk through Torah. But that's later, not now. For now, Moses feels safe in Midian, safe enough to sit and rest next to the well. The well, well, well. We know this story, a well story that must include at least one beautiful, young, nubile woman, right? So let's look. Yeah, where the hell coming from? It is well with my heart. It is well, my soul. No, that's when this poor man's family ends up at the bottom of the ocean. And, and it's a real, real story. I mean, it really happened that he's saying, I know you did it for a reason, God. God bless him. I don't know how he was able to take a breath, no less right. Wasn't this. the well a social area? Yeah. yeah. Where people in the town met. Yeah. I mean, they didn't go to church like we do. No, or no churches yet. Or go to the store or... No. Nope. Like it was like the bar. That's right. You know, that's why you <laughs> buy a well drink. No, it's a, it's very true. Yeah, the pub. <laughs> so, um, Jay's stories almost always contain, involve a beautiful woman. But now, look at this one. The priest of Midian had seven beautiful nubile daughters. And guess where we meet them in this text? At the well, they went there to draw water for their father's flocks. And is this starting to sound familiar to you? Seven beautiful girls at the well where Moses is sitting. And no doubt, he watches them lower the buckets and then pull them up and then empty them into the troughs all around the well. And he must have been enjoying the view because he just sits there watching. And then <laughs> shepherds come and drove off the woman. They were bullies. These young, pretty women had just done all the work, hauling the water, filling the troughs, bucket by bucket. And now that they're filled, the bully shepherds drive the women and their sheep away and bring their own flocks to the troughs. So not fair, but don't worry, because Moses rises to their defense. He may have been tired from his long trip, but come on, he's Moses, right? And he will not tolerate injustice. 
that's how he got to that well in the first place. And this is the third time that Moses will make a wrong right. First time, stops the Egyptian from beating a Hebrew. Second, he stops two Hebrews from fighting. And now, Moses moves into action and he chases the shepherds away from the well. And then he himself refills the troughs and waters the girls' flocks himself. The girls, all seven of them, ooh, they're all a flutter and they run home to their father, who in our text is named Reuel. Do you all see that, very mm -hmm. well? Mm -hmm. I didn't pronounce it that way in the text. <clears throat> oh, um, and he's surprised to see his daughters back so early. They're supposed to be watering his flocks. So he asks them, what are you doing here? Why are you back so soon? Now, Reu or Reuel, the father of these seven beauties, is a Midian. But in the text, he has a Hebrew name, Reuel, El. Remember, El is a name for God. Mm -hmm. So his name means friend of God. Now later, we're going to read that this man's name is not Reuel. Rather, it's Jethro. In Hebrew, Yitro. But later still in the text, we're going to name, we're going to hear that the name Reuel and Jethro and Yitro is actually Hobab. But he'll always be Jethro to me. That's how I think of him. But then the girls tell him the whole story. Oh, Dad, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us, refilled the troughs, and then he watered your flocks. So and they call him an Egyptian. That's exactly because right. Of his clothing, uh, his Beard. clothing, his demeanor. He's he's like forty years old. He spent like thirty well, years. Well, they shaved, didn't they? Might have even Egyptian. shaved his head. Egyptians didn't love body hair. Yeah. They, they have kind of fetish about being super clean. And beards and head hair. Lice territory. Bugs. Yeah. So clearly, as Erica just said, the girls thought that Moses was Egyptian, probably because of his clothes. He didn't have time to change. He had to run, right? So now the shepherds harassing the girls at the well. This isn't a made-up story. This was not unusual. It happened all the time. Shepherds were savages. They lived with the animals, and they smelled like the animals, and they behaved like the animals. And this happened to these girls all the time. But today, Reuel is intrigued, and he wants to meet the man who rescued his daughters. And did you notice our author, Jay, makes a point of telling us that Moses drew the water out of the well for the girls. So he's living up to his name, right? Moses is drawn out of the water, then he draws the water out of the well. Clever, clever girl. I love, I love Jay. Now, back to the story. Reuel wants to meet this man, so he asks his daughter, where is this man? Why do you leave him at the well? Go, hurry back and ask him to have dinner with us. Ask him to break bread with us. And Moses came for dinner. And Moses stayed way past dinner. And that's just fine with Reuel, who gives one of his daughters to Moses as a wife, Sephora. And Sephora has a meaning in Hebrew. Um, it means bird. So here's another Midian with a Hebrew name. Well, Moses marries Sephora, another da -da 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 happy ending, another romantic well story. Remember, Rebecca marries Isaac, Rachel marries Jacob, and Moses marries Sephora. And Moses and Sephora have a son, of course they do, and Moses names him Gershon which is a Hebrew name, and it means, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. His name is, right? Ger, today, is the Hebrew word for stranger. And remember Abraham's concubine, Hagar, Hagar? Her name, too, means strangers. And remember the covenant that God made with Abraham? In part, God said to Abraham, your offspring will be 
be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And we know that God meant Egypt, not Midian. And we know that the prediction of slavery for 400 years that God made to Abraham has been fulfilled. It's been 400 years. And now it's morning time. Liberation is at hand. So the birth of Moses' child is symbolic of the birth of the people of Israel. And now the writer E takes over the story. And he writes, a long time after that, the king of Egypt died. And the Israelites were groaning under their bondage and they cried out and God heard them. Now that Egyptian king, the Pharaoh, may have been Seti I, who ruled Egypt in the 13th century BCE. The people are moaning, and God heard them moaning and groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God looked down on the Israelites and took notice of them. And just so you know, this is not the last time God and all of us will hear the Israelites groan. Honest to God, they moaned for 40 years, so get used to it. And scholars think that this section of our text was written by E because the name um, that E calls God is not Yahweh, like J does. Rather, E calls God El, which is E's name for God. And did you notice the last three verses are different from those that came before. They sort of sound like a lament. The people are groaning and moaning. They're lamenting. And the lament is linked to the covenant. So here we see the people's problems become God's problems. And that's the chapter. Only one chapter, but so chock full. Covers a lot of time. Birth of Moses, his early childhood, his adulthood, and finally, the introduction of Moses as the rescuer of his people. So this will be the middle of an hour and a half on that one chapter. <laughs> yeah. Now, some scholars say each of these sections cover a period of 40 years, maybe. But it sure moves fast from Hebrew oppression in Egypt to the birth of Moses, then his failure to remain in Egypt, and finally his flight to Midian. And did you notice, we're talking about God and how he grows and changes in the text. God is actively involved in the life of Moses and his people. The writer tells us God heard, God remembered, God looked, God took notice. So God keeps his eyes on the Israelites. But the Israelites don't know this. They don't know that God sees them and hears them. Not yet, but when they become aware of this, everything in the world changes forever. And Rabbi Heschel, absolutely love, defines the birth of Jewish religion as the awareness of God's interest in man, which is wonderful, right? Especially if we think of the Alpha, the Omega, um, which very often has made people believe well, the Alpha, that's the beginning. God has a beginning, Omega. God has an end. But what does Jesus tell us? There's no beginning or no end. No beginning, no, no end. end. I am. Yeah, you know, and that's what I, I, I spent the this. Yeah, yeah, I spent the week talking or to myself, mostly, and Lucy. She knows everything now, <laughs> about I am. You know, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, so I love what Heschel says about awareness of God, of God's interest in man, is really the birth of religion, the relationship. You can't have a religion without a relationship. And I love that. Now, the rest of our story is a result of God's remembering. And here we have another well story, a well story that leads to a wedding, like Rebecca and Rachel, wedding well stories. So now that we've met Moses, what do you think about him so far? Very, he's probably the most important character we've met so far. I'm not gonna pull anything over on him. No, 
not a dope. Yeah. He's kind of a miracle, right? What he survived. Yeah. Well, he was he was educated by you know in the Pharaoh's household. Yep. So he was was not like a typical Hebrew in that he was you know educated. He spoke Egyptian. He you know he, he probably knew astronomy. Mm -hmm. But I think what's also fascinating is that he was educated in a Hebrew household, at least for the first three years of his life. So he knew things about God and about God's relationship and how God wants to be worshipped that Egyptians didn't know. He so, also was, I mean, he, he was um, very aware of injustice and, and dealt with injustice. A moral man, a moral and that man. that word should be the subtitle of Torah, a moral man. And this is a somebody, and he's been called the most powerful hero in biblical history. Do you guys know who Elie Wiesel is? Oh, well, he's, oh, he's, yeah. yeah, he's dead now, but he was a Nobel Prize winning writer, survivor of the Holocaust. Um, and he says that after Moses, nothing else was ever the same again. Literally changed the world. Now keep that in mind as we get to know Moses better. Was, a, was Pharaoh's daughter a, a virgin too? Oh, seriously, she might have said so, but not a chance, right? Never, never discussed. That's interesting. Raised. Moses essentially, right? I mean, Pharaoh's daughter took Moses as her own, right? And he sat in the seat of Eden Hill, virgin. <laughs> Interesting. She, she comes back, if she was a virgin, and I'm thinking about Jesus and the Virgin Mary. Right. Um, right. You know, you're thinking, was the. And Mary, Moses? the mother of Jesus, was really his adoptive mother, right? In the sense that conceived by the Holy Spirit, not by her. Husband. But yeah. she was his mother. I mean, you always know you always know who the mother is. You can go always know who the father is, but you can know who the mother is. And who the virgin and the child. Yes. And who shows up on that mountain with Jesus when, Moses, they, when he's Moses. transfigured? So, did you notice Moses gets away with so much? He's very violent. I mean, there's no doubt about it. He kills that Egyptian, right? So he's a violent, convicted murderer with a terrible temper. And he will try all during his life, you'll see, to control that temper with varying success. But um, the way the rabbis get around this is saying it's righteous anger, you know, righteous anger. But it still needs to be controlled. And as we continue the Moses story here in Torah, we're going to just take a quick diversion to look at the Christian version of Moses and Cindy Berries, oh, wow. Bonnie Berries, um, and the Islamic version of Moses. In the Quran, Moses is called Musa, Musa. And the Moses that Jay presents here in the Torah represents Moses as an Israelite from the house of Levi, brought up as an Egyptian member of the upper class who was forced to flee Midian, where he meets a head priest, Zipporah's father, marries one of his daughters. What are the odds, right? Oh, thank you, thank you. Now, no, I got it. I'm going to put this right there. Thank you so much. Now, do you think that Moses knew his birth family well? Thank you, Donna. Miriam, Aaron, Yaakobed, and Amram. Probably, right? For we the get first the three years, anyway. Yeah. yeah. And Miriam and Aaron go on the Exodus with him. And some people say that his parents did too, which is kind of live forever, right? Seems like he knows he's a Hebrew. He doesn't turn his back. Um, and that's why he loses it when he sees the two Hebrews fighting. Um, and also when he sees the one Hebrew being beaten by the Egyptian slave master. <clears throat> and I think it's interesting that Moses moves from city life at the palace, where he learned to be a priest, and 
actually, I think he learned to be a prince, not a priest. No, prince. I think that's more, yeah. The prince of Egypt. His father was a priest, but he was a prince. Um, and he moves to Midian to a primitive Bedouin tent camp in the desert. And there is where he learned to be a man of the desert. And that was a very tough life, and it still is. There are still Bedouins today. And Moses learns how to live in the desert, how to keep his flocks alive. And it had to be a very lonely life. You know, you're out there on the plains with your sheep. I mean, he was coming from a palace filled with people and, and spending time with his birth family in the town. So alone must have been hard for him, a change. But the time in the desert, the Midian, was important because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to lead them through the desert for 40 years. Exactly. Teachable, teachable time. Now, I want you to think about another character, non-human character in this story, which is really a story throughout the Bible. It's just, sorry, really a main character throughout the Bible. We've talked about land being a character. And here, water. Water is introduced again. Um, as a character in our story. And keep this in mind as we continue this story. Water remains very important. As from the very beginning, Moses is placed in the water, the Nile River. He's drawn out of the water by a princess who was bathing in that water. And he meets his wife at the well. And he draws water for her and for her sisters. And water is an ancient symbol. Well, hello, honey. Oh. An ancient symbol for wisdom and power. So whenever you see water in, uh, in a Bible story, it's always connected with power, either power of the mind or physical power. Well, because it's a requirement for life. Absolutely. And it's scarce in this <coughs> part of the world. Very <coughs> scarce. Um, <coughs> I wondered why, um, okay, Miriam, I don't know, the, uh, the princess who found him in the water, she knew he was uh, a Hebrew. Oh, yeah. But her father must have realized it, too, but he allowed her to keep the child. Yeah. So, well, who knows? So now he's in the desert. What happened? Well, because it was sort of like, you know, he sort of let her keep it kind of like, uh, a tolerant father lets a, a child keep a dog or a cat. I mean, it was almost that kind of same thing that she wanted. She wanted. A, she wanted a pet. She wanted something to keep it her. It was busy. more for his daughter than it was for the baby. Yeah. Right. It was a great doll baby. And maybe he, maybe he wasn't <laughs> fond one. of killing babies. But I think. But also, I, I, I think Pharaoh became endeared to Moses. Don't you get that idea that he kind of. Well, and Cecil B. DeMille's room, sure. Until he I, I, kisses them up. And there's, what is the other story? The Ten Commandments? Isn't, isn't yeah. that part of it? Yeah. yeah. That is the that's, Ten that's Commandments. That is the story. Oh, that's I, the film. I've never seen it. You've what? never seen it? Oh, oh my, you really should oh, watch it because it's quite the epic, really. Is that the Charlton Heston? Yes. Yeah, of course I've seen segments, but you it's funny. We, it. we did a whole um, <laughs> class on it. And the professor's like, don't watch it. It is inaccurate from start to finish. It'll make yourself crazy. But that's not why I haven't seen it. I don't know how to do that on my TV, you know, find all those. Well, oh, it's always oh. on, on the on you know, Saturday fine. before go Easter. Go up it's in it'll say ABC, search. But ABC shows it every year on, oh, on, on Easter, on, on Easter oh, weekend, yeah, on true. Saturday. Oh, on Easter? Yes, on Easter. You it shows the Moses. On Ten Easter, isn't that Ten Commandments? Commandments? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. I'm very interested. Or Christmas, I was it Christmas. It? It might I haven't Christmas. seen it in years, but I'm well, I pretty I much know, it's sure. always Easter Either time. Either one would be odd. Kind of like Ten it's, Commandments, but it's still. It's a wonderful it's, life, is you know. It's that or been her. Now that I've seen, I the, see every the, single the year. I I own that. Easter. Well, how wonderful that we can read in this old testament. And we're able, hello, to watch the reign of God being born right before our very eyes. 
and notice who God has chosen to work in his kingdom. Starts off with Shipra and Pua. Can we help you? We're looking for a Willow Bend meeting. Looking for? Willow Bend meeting? For the Willow Bend Willow meeting. Bend. The Willow Bend HOA. Uh, what time? Is I think it's today? at one, what, what time does it start? I thought they said one o'clock. I think it's Brilliant. probably yeah, one thirty. <laughs> Okay. You want to go check the calendar? Won't you sit down? Just check. Hold just on a minute. Sit down and take a. Yeah, we'll find out for you. Okay. Well, what, what Welcome. <laughs> what happens to Moses' wife when he's out here in the desert? Oh, very interesting. We're going to follow her. I mean, is she there too? Oh yes, yes oh, okay. indeed. So. If she's a good wife, she's better. I, I really wanted Elaine to hear this because yeah. she. When we started this study, she said this was one of the things, what we're going to talk about now, is what she liked most about God's plan for his creation. And it starts with Shipra and Pua. God put them there for a reason, and she's coming back. The meeting was Easter. It's on Palm. It's on Palm Sunday weekend. ABC has shown it. I just don't understand what the Ten Commandments has to do with Palm Sunday. In 2024, it's, it's being broadcast on the night before Easter Sunday. It, it just and about three weeks before the beginning of Passover. Yeah, Passover. You know? I get it. it so is, but... it it shows it. It'll, it's on. Or Shavuot, the but giving of the Ten Commandments. I can see that. Pentecost. Oh, All right. So this we waited for you to get back because. Oh, I want you to notice who God has chosen to work in his kingdom. Shipra and Pua, the two midwives, right? Practically at the bottom of the social ladder, the bottom of society. And that shows, as Elaine has told us, God works from the bottom up, not from the top down. And these two women are joined by two more women, Jacobet and Miriam who were born into slavery in Egypt, and they're saviors. So, so far, Pharaoh has been foiled by two midwives and two Hebrew slave women, and finally, by his own daughter and her maid. And God wants us to know that you don't have to be mighty or to the manner born in order to change the world. And I love that, right? And Torah also teaches that we should always let God know what's going on with us. God likes hearing from us. And even more important, God hears us. Wait, you know? wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, if God hears us all the time, why do we have to let God know what's going on? Because doesn't God already know? He loves. He knows. He knew before you were even in that womb. He knows how many hairs are on your head. God knows where you were, where you're going to be, but he loves so relationships the sound excited. of your voice. He loves hearing from you. God doesn't want to be your provider. He wants to be in love with you, and he wants There's a relationship. You can't have a relationship if it's one-sided, so we have to be in communion and communication with him just as he is, knows what's going on in our lives. And he knows even when we don't know how to express ourselves, what we're feeling. But it's the fact that we are, we are in communion with him that really creates the relationship that we have. And, and that idea of like some people will say, all right, I'm not exactly an atheist, but I'm more like, okay, God was a clockmaker. And he set the clock and then he's out. You know, or God was a machinist. He built it and then he's out of there. But that's not the God that I love and worship. That's not my Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior loves hearing what I have to say, even when I'm not always yeah, you are my neighbor. I tell him. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and God heard the Israelites, right? They're slaving away for Pharaoh, and they're watching their baby boys being killed, and they groan, and they cry out, and God hears 
them. And God remembers his covenant. God remembers his promises. Through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God remembered and took notice of them. So we should remember, never suffer in silence. And never give up. I mean, 400 years is a long time to be. Keep talking. Crazy. Let God know what's going on with you. And that's, um, God is still talking is the, the, what do we call mission statement or something of, of the UCC Church on Shamrock. But I think just as important as God is still talking, God is still listening. Yeah, I, I just love that. But as we, starting in Torah, now in Exodus, I'm not saying that God is getting on in years here, but he doesn't see as well and you know, he seems to forget things easier. And now, I'm not saying that, that we have to tell him what's going on because he can't hear us. You know, he's getting older and hard of hearing. He loves hearing from us. So tell him what you need after you tell him how much you love him. And I know that was all politically incorrect for her, as Rabbi Ann would say, for them. And next week, we're going to learn more about the mission. Moses gets a call. And I love these chapters. Of course, the call that Moses gets is a very unique call. In fact, Moses is the only one to be called the way that he is called. And we'll hear that next week in Exodus chapters 3 and 4. So next week, our reading starts the story of liberation. God talks to Moses, and it's thrilling. But don't think that Moses starts the relationship. Moses does not discover God. He doesn't just go out into the desert, and one fine day, he just bumps into God, right? It doesn't work that way. Moses is discovered by God. Just as Moses was drawn out of the water, and as we saw Moses drawing water out of the well, we will see God drawing Moses into himself. And that is thrilling, I think. And I hope you have a thrilling week. We, um, before you, many of you got here, Elaine, Chuck, and I saw all the problems of this church will. I wrote it all down. I was the only one writing anything down. I'll tell you all about it. Um, we're still... So God bless you all listening from home. Please let us know. And um, we miss you. Everybody want to say hello? I hope Tom and Jim hey. are watching. We miss you and we love you and we want you to come back soon. Yeah. I need more men here to defend me, <laughs> to help me defend ourselves, our masculinity. Yes. Is it? And those of you who are listening from home, send Carrie an email and say, thank you, Carrie, for taping this and posting this. And I wish you all Shavua Tov. Shavua Tov. Um, so according, you know, the, the Bible is, Moses' wife's name is Zipporah. In the, the uh, Sephardim mill, the name is Sephora. Like the, oh. the com cosmetics company. Uh, the P -A Seriously, yeah. I've never seen that. I did not know that because I just was was looking. Thank up you, on darling. It. Yes, and everybody said thank you online too. So I just thought that was sort of interesting. Yeah. I think that's very interesting. Emails, 